It says the same as negotiating a contract with Joel to procure customized thingies that will only be of use to Sam's firm in making gizmos. So what's happening here is the, we don't know the cost, neither Sam nor Joel right now knows the cost of making these thingies. They just know that it could be low, which was 0.2 per unit, or it could be high, which is a dollar per unit. Now Joel will find out the true cost before production is finalized, but he can't be forced to reveal this to Sam. And he has to at least have his cost covered or he doesn't have to do the project. So it tells us that Sam can extract a value of 20Q to the 0.5 uh, for all the get, um, thingies that he gets out of Joel. The question says, if Sam designs the optimum contract to deal with this asymmetric information problem, what is the contract payment if costs turn out to be low and a large number of units are delivered? So what they're asking us for is PL, which is the contract payment to Joel for low cost. Keep in mind here, QL is not QL as in low demand, but QL as in low cost. So QL is gonna be a larger amount of units than QH. So again, we're looking for PL, and keep in mind that QL is greater than QH. So first, let's write down what we know. We know there's a 60% chance that the cost is gonna be 20 cent, a 40% chance that the cost is gonna be high at a dollar per unit, and the value we are given is 20Q to the 0.5, and again, we're looking for PL. Well, we need to first write profit. Again, profit, we need to think about just plainly. What is profit for the firm, for Sam in this case? Well, there's a 60% chance he's gonna get a low quantity value. So in this case, this is a lot of units. QL is more than QH. So in this in 60% of the time, he's gonna get a lot of units and he's gonna pay Joel a price. So PL is gonna be higher. Uh, I'm sorry, PL is the price when there's a low cost job. So in this case, this represents the profit that Sam will get if there's a low cost job, and we know that it happens 60% of the time. 40% of the time, there's gonna be a high cost job. Well, in that case, he's only gonna get 20 times QH, which is now we know a smaller number, minus the cost, the, uh, the cost for Sam, which is the price he pays to Joel, or the contract payment he pays to Joel, which we'll call PH. So again, in these problems, we wanna think about profit a little more creatively, uh, make it simple, make it to where you can understand it make sure you understand it. Well, we're gonna have constraints again. First, we're gonna have a participation constraint. Well, this is aimed at the high cost job. In menu pricing, the participation constraint was, was aimed at the low demand consumer. The way I like to think about this and remember it, the participation constraint is aimed at the worst thing for the firm, right? The low demand consumer is the worst guy for the firm. We'd rather have a high demand consumer. The high cost job is the worst thing for the firm. We'd rather have a low cost job. So that helps me understand it. You can use it if you want. Again, it's aimed at the high cost job. This needs to make Joel at least participate with us, which says that the contract payment we pay him minus the actual cost of the job must be greater than or equal to zero. So if costs are high, we have to at least cover his cost or he won't work with us. Because if it costs him a dollar to make it and we're only gonna pay him 90 cent per unit, well then he's gonna take a loss and there's no reason he would do that. So that's the participation constraint. We can plug in our values. We know that the marginal cost when it's high is $1. So the selection constraint, well, this is aimed at the low cost job. We like to call this the truth telling constraint because it is like it sounds. This constraint is gonna incentivize Joel to tell the truth, to be honest. So on the left side, we're gonna have the truth, which is he told us it's a low cost job and we, we paid him PL it actually did cost him the marginal cost of a low cost job. And we ordered the quantity that we would order if he told us it's a low cost job. We're gonna make that greater than or equal to if he lied. So the right side's a lie and understand why. Well, he told us it's a high cost job. So we paid him for a high cost job, but costs were actually low, but we still ordered a high cost jobs quantity. So understand that truth on the left the lie on the right, this is, we're gonna incentivize him to tell the truth. This is the truth telling constraint. We call it the selection constraint. We can plug in what we know. We know marginal cost for a low cost job is 0.2. Marginal cost 
um, and, and on the right, we're going to have that point two again because he had lied on the right, so costs were actually low, and he said costs were high. Now, in all these problems, there's actually four constraints, and two of them are binding. These are the two binding constraints. The non-binding constraints are just the opposite constraints. So in this case, we had pH minus 1 QH is greater than or equal to 0. Well, the non-binding participation constraint would be PL minus 0.2 QL is greater than or equal to 0. Likewise, we would just substitute everywhere we see a PL and a QL, we would substitute it with pH and a QH. So you might want to know that. There's definitely a chance that he'll talk about naming all four constraints. But know that these are the two that bind. So from here, we're going to use both constraints. And we're going to look at profit. And we're going to substitute in for PL and pH into our profit function. Well, pH is easy because we can solve for it. We know that pH is equal to 1 QH. So substituting in for pH in our profit function is pretty easy. PL is not as straightforward again, but we know that we know we know that we can substitute what we know for pH, which is 1 QH, straight into uh, the PL or the selection constraint. And now we need to solve for PL. So we substitute that in, we combine like terms and rearrange this thing, and we get PL is equal to 0.2 QL plus 0.8 QH. Well, now that we have both of our constraints solved, we can plug that into profit and we get this for profit. So now we're just going to be taking the derivative with respect to both QL and QH and solving for our QL and our QH. Taking the derivative with respect to QL, we get 0.6 times 10 QL raised to the negative 0.5 minus 0.2, and all that equals 0. The reason I left the 0.6 on the outside here is because in this one, we can divide the whole thing through by 0.6. Dividing 0 through by 0.6 just gives us 0. So that makes our life easy, just a little easier uh, on the math. Now we can solve for QL. And in this case, when we, and now I told you I'd be using a shortcut. We know that this is really a positive QL to the 0.5 on the bottom. And we could cross multiply to get to this step. So I just did that all in one step. Now we can solve that QL is going to be equal to 2,500. Taking the derivative with respect to QH, well, now we have to be careful. We have a QH in the first part as well as the QHs in the second part. So the distributing through the 0.6 is going to be important, and keeping the 0.4 is also going to be important because we can't just divide through to both sides like we did last time because of that 0.6 times the 0.8. And now we can combine like terms and solve. And in this case, we find QH to be equal to 20.66. So this question asked us to find the contract payment if costs turn out to be low and a large number is ordered, a large quantity is ordered. Well, that was asking us for PL. And we know that PL is equal to 0.2 QL plus 0.8 QH. So that's why we had to solve for not only QL, but we also had to solve for QH in order to solve for PL. In this case, that's your answer. Remember that when costs are low, QL in this case is going to be larger than QH, which is why he says, and a large number of units are ordered.